All right, so let's just go ahead and kind of recap. We've gone through this quite a few times. Do we want to read it again, or do you all feel like we can just come right in to where we left off? How do you all want to proceed? Anybody, it's anybody, anybody? It's up to you. I would, I would say for the sake of time, because we've read this several times, Let's go ahead and, and jump back in. <clears throat> Reviewing again, the beginning was the word. Remember, we had talked about this last week and how it is. Um, Ima Sharon really brought this out and how, you know, we're dealing with the spirit and the word, you know, um, being one of those first things that were created. The Torah, we know, according to the Midrash, was, you know, one of the first things created with the Messiah's name, right? With the throne, uh, with Gehenna, repentance. So there were seven things I believe Ima Sharon brought up that were created before day one. And so the word, of course, was one of those seven things being the Torah. And the beginning was the Torah. That's what we can identify this is, as. And what? Here's my question, though. Think about this. What is the Torah the expression of? What does the Torah express? What would you say the Torah is the expression of? I think once we capture this, we can really start to see how and why it is considered with and was Elohim. I was reading earlier that the Torah is like the expression of, how can I put this? The Yah's expression mm -hmm. in relation to creation, like his expression, it's in everything. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. God's word. So the word, yes. Yes. So let's let's do this. Let's look to First Corinthians chapter two. And then we're going to look at Philippians chapter two as well. And this is why this is so important. We come down to the last verse. Right. Well, let me go to Philippians two first. I'm sure you all can see that already. Let's go to Philippians. To the assembly of Philippi. What is the Torah? Torah, we know. Is this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Messiah Yahushua. Right. Who, being in the form of Elohim, did not regard equality with Elohim a matter to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a servant and came to be in the likeness of men. And having been found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, death even of a stake. <clears throat> so the Messiah was somewhat e equal with Elohim. He was not Elohim. Let's be clear. El Elyon is not Elohim. El Elyon is completely beyond. OK. Elohim. Here's a deep question. What does Elohim refer to? More than one God. Mm, yeah, but let's contextualize this. Let's contextualize it. Let's contextualize. It. So there's a theologian by the name of Michael Heisner. And some of his uh, components, his proponents are very interesting. 
He quotes Psalm 82, 1, where he says, Elohim is taking his place in the divine council. In the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment, right? The term divine council is used by Hebrew and Semit Semitic scholars to refer to the heavenly host, the pantheon of divine beings who administer the affairs of the cosmos. All ancient Mediterranean cultures had some concept of a divine council. The divine council of Israelite religion, known primarily through the Psalms, was distinct in important ways. The divine council in Hebrew is known as Elohim. What is, what are an Elohim? Okay. Let's just get to it. So Yahweh is inherently distinct and superior to all other Elohim. This is what we were talking about earlier. Yah is an Elohim, but no other Elohim are Yahweh. Right? Yah is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is Yah. So he's not assuming that the last chapter answered all your questions about the divine council, though I'm betting that many of you are like I was after first discovering what the inspired text really says, what the ancient worldview of Israel really assumed. You still may be stuck on the idea that there can only be one Elohim since Yah is called Elohim in so many places in the scriptures. And if that's not true, you might be asking, then what is an Elohim, right? So when we go to the concordance and we look up what Elohim means in the concordance, number 430, we see that this refers to rulers, judges, divine ones, angels, gods, okay? It is a reference to the supreme God also by way of deference to magistrates, right? Sometimes it's superlative to angels, to great judges, to those who are mighty. So when we're looking at Elohim, Elohim is the council of beings that Yah has brought together to bring forth his kingdom, to establish his order. Remember, Yah is transcendent, Yah is beyond. Yah uses agents and agencies to go about bringing forth the reality that Yah desires through his words, through the Torah. So going back to the original question, what is the Torah? The Torah is what we know as the mind of Yah. The Torah is the expression, rather, of the mind of Yah. Mashiach was with Elohim. Mashiach was Elohim because Mashiach had the mind of Elohim. But it lets us know in 1 Corinthians 2 that we also are to have the mind of Elohim or the mind of Messiah. And if we have the mind of Messiah, we have the mind of Elohim. So coming back to John 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with Elohim and the word was Elohim. This lets us know that it is the Torah that brings everything into oneness with Yah. Because that was what was in the beginning with Elohim, the Torah. And if we are one with the Torah, we too can say what Yahushua said about Abraham and Abraham seeing his day and was glad. And before Abraham was, in fact, I am. Why? Because I have become the Torah incarnate. And that is the goal for everybody who is in Mashiach and living according to the Torah. Romans 10, 4, we've gone through this so many times. For Messiah is the goal of the Torah unto righteousness to everyone who believes. This is how we attain the mind of Messiah. By yielding, learning, from the Torah. How do we do that? Well, let's see what Galatians tells us. Everybody following along so far? Is anything too over the top? Is everything clear? Is Are we making sense? Is sense being made? Yes, sir. Amen. All right. <laughs> so let's go. Here we go. Now, keep in mind, 
When you say Torah, you got to actually be able to contextualize the Torah. There's a Torah of sin and death, right? <clears throat> There's an instruction, there is a law that if you transgress the Torah of Yah, you die. There's a Torah of life in Messiah, Yahushua. There's a Levitical Torah. There's a Torah of love, right? So the Torah has many different facets and aspects. So when we're reading, when you're talking about law, this law is no longer. This law, if the Torah, you know, if inheritance is by the Torah, it's no longer by promise. What Torah are they talking about? Well, they're talking about the Torah of the Levitical order. That's the works of the Torah. The works of the Torah are relative to making sacrifices in order to receive atonement, as opposed to being obedient to the Torah and being righteous and believing in him who he sent. And that's inclusive of you. If you believe the Messiah is in you, or you believe that Yah has sent you with the nation to go about reconciling and redeeming humanity, starting with yourself. Ima Leoria, yes, ma'am. I think that what, what's coming to my mind as you're speaking is um, the more we, you know, the way we've been studying, um, it really brings that 119th Psalm, mm. you know, um, I encourage everyone to, to learn your alphabet and then really start drilling down with the language and um i know it, it's a, a journey but at least learning the alphabet and that because um just to see the importance like all uh, what am i trying to say the hebrew the the letters are sacred you know the yes. letters, it's not just like english it's not what we're looking at now mm -hmm. english. it's right. so they're alive there um as some have said you know this is the building blocks of what everything is made on so to speak created by these by the words of torah mm -hmm. um so that that's the thing that i you know what i think it's like when you think of that 119 psalm and the Many of the psalms go that way with um the Aleph and the Bet. That's not the only one, but for some reason they preserve the Aleph and the Bet, you know, right. in the stand right. of that. Huh. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Psalm 119 is an entire ode to the Torah. <laughs> Everything in that chapter is about the Torah. Let's see. I want to I think it may be chapter two. It's voice and dealing with Isaac. There it is. So 26. Galatians chapter three tells us the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as of many but as of one and to your seed, who is Messiah, right? Now this I say, Torah, this is where I want to come to this very important point here that came 430 years later. So they're saying the Torah came 430 years after Abraham does not annul a covenant previously confirmed by Elohim and Messiah so as to do away with the promise. So when we go to Genesis 26, and we read verse five, we see Abraham obeyed my voice and guarded my charge, my commands, my laws, and my Torah, which is plural for the singular Torah. So there is a, an, a unique Torah that is spoken of in verse 17 in light of the Torah that we read of in Genesis 26 verse 5, that Abraham observed. Because remember, the Torah was in the beginning. The word was in the beginning. Let's find where it says, Torah 1, 
of seven things created before creation. Right? An ancient Barita handed down in different versions enumerates six or seven persons or things created before the world came into being. The Torah, which is called the firstling of his way. That's what Psalm 8 talks about. Excuse me, Proverbs 8 talks about. So the Torah was in the beginning. And so the Torah that is being mentioned here in verse 17 of Galatians 3, again, is specifically speaking of the Levitical Torah that Moses introduced to Israel as a result of the sin of the golden calf. They had to rectify the behavior. They had to actually atone for the sin that Israel committed. And so this Torah comes into existence to counteract the deviation that took place with Israel. Israel deviated from the past, so to bring Israel back to the past, the Levitical law was created. The Levitical priesthood was created. What was the order of the priests before the Levites? What was the order of the priesthood before Levi came into the fold? Um, Melchizedek? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the Melchizedekian order, which is righteousness. Everybody was living a righteous life. Everybody was faithful and obedient to Torah. Everybody was through the firstborn. But if the inheritance is by Torah, it is no longer by promise. But Elohim gave it to Abraham through a promise. Now, Abraham was obedient to the word of Yah. And it was credited to him as being righteous. Why then the Torah? This is here where it gets deep. It was added because of transgressions. This Torah of sin and death brought forth the Torah of the Levitical priesthood. And it was added because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained through messengers in the hand of a mediator. The mediator, however, is not of one, but Elohim is one. Is then the Torah against the promises of Elohim? Let it not be. For if a law had been given that was able to make alive, truly righteousness would have been by Torah. But the scripture has shut up all mankind under sin that the promise by belief in Yahushua might be given to those who believe. But before belief came, now this is obedience, right? This is what faithfulness is. If you look at this word here, I need to see where they have that. That word is emunah, right? Before truth came. Before veracity came, before steadfastness came, we were being guarded under Torah, having been shut up for the belief being about to be revealed. And this is what the goal of the Torah is all about here. This is addressing the goal of the Torah. Therefore, the Torah became our trainer unto Messiah. The Torah is what teaches us how to become the Messiah in order to be declared right by faithfulness, by being trustworthy, by living in spirit and truth and serving Yah in that manner. And after belief has come, we are no longer under a trainer. Why? It's because it's like, it's like a championship fight. You think of the training season and sessions that both the challenger and the champion go through preparing themselves for the contest. But when that time test comes, guess what? You're not on your own. You're not. Now you're not on your own without Yah. What I'm saying is that training that you have undergone has now prepared you to apply everything that you've learned in this contest. That's what the Torah is doing. When the more and more we study Torah, the more and more we're learning how to conduct ourselves, the more we're learning how to speak, the more we're learning how to think, the more we're learning how to present ourselves to Yah. And this is where it gets even deeper. For you are all sons of Elohim through belief 
in Messiah Yahushua. This is where it says in John 1, go, let's go back there right quick. It says, as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become children of Elohim to those believing in his name. That's how this all comes together, right? We are all sons of Elohim and daughters of Elohim through belief in Messiah Yahushua when we receive him. For as many of you as were immersed into Messiah, here's this mystery again, you have put on Messiah, the goal of the Torah. You've accomplished the goal of the Torah. There is not Yahudi nor Greek. There is not slave nor free. There is not male and female, for you are all one in Messiah Yahushua. And if you are of Messiah, then you are the seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. So what does that point back to? Well, that points back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, where it tells us Elohim made, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea. And this is what Elohim said, right? So Elohim made Elohim. And over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock of over the over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over the creeping creatures that creep on the earth, and Elohim created the man in his image. In the image of Elohim, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is the primordial Messiah right here. And we've gone over this so many times. We've gone over this so many times, but the way that he created this image was through the Torah. In the beginning was the word, the word was with Elohim, and the word was Elohim. He was in the beginning with Elohim. And when we get to this point, we too can say what Yahushua said, and we'll become conscious of it. Before Abraham was, I am. Why? Because we were in the beginning with him, because we have now, just like our master, we have incarnated the word. This is our ultimate goal. This is the ultimate work. This is everything. This is everything. The word became flesh. This is our ultimate work. This is how we become the image and likeness of Yah. This is how Yahushua became the exact representation that it tells us in Hebrews chapter 2 of who Yahushua became. Why? Because he was faithful to the Torah. Faithful to Yah in covenant. By keeping the Torah. I'm sorry, it's chapter one. It tells us Elohim having of old spoken in many portions in many ways to the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken to us by the Son. And the Son is the one who opened the door to the name so that we can enter in and become as he did. And the son is he who was appointed as heir of all, through whom also he made the ages. Why? Because the son is the word. Who? Here's a key. Being the brightness of his esteem, that's the image, and the exact representation of his substance, that's the likeness, and sustaining all by the word of his power, having made a cleansing of our sins through himself, sat down at the right hand of the greatness on high. But this is what we are to do. Because the father appointed the son to be the firstborn of the new Adam, the second Adam, the second Adam, the second humanity. He's the firstborn of the new humanity. And so Yohanan is preparing for us, preparing us for that particular transformation. Now, Yohanan was the one who was sent to bear witness to this light. It tells us he was not the light, no, but that he might bear witness of that light. But he's a part of it. He's a part of it. But there had to be, first and foremost, an example that came to humanity to show humanity Yah's image and Yah's likeness, exactly. And that's what Yahushua accomplished. Praise Yah. And this is where that birth takes place 
It says, as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become children of Elohim, to those believing in his name, right? To those placing themselves in that office. Remember, we talked about what the word name meant in the Hebrew. It's an office. It's a position, right? It's not just a name that, you know, somebody has. Let me come this way. All right. So again, name is an assigned position. Those believing in the assigned positions, to those believing in the gift of service, to those believing in the spiritual positioning that Yahushua walked in, to those believing in seeking to become the wisdom that anoints, the attributes of wisdom that administer the flow of energies, to those Believing in the positioning and the governing spiritual allotment, the purpose, those believing in the purpose of this name. Yahushua is Yah who saves us. Mashiach is the anointed. How does Yah save us? He gives us his word. He gives us his covenant. He gives us his promises. He gives us his blessing. And all of those lead to life and life everlasting. But this is the birth that we have to go through. Not of blood, nor of the desire of flesh, nor of the desire of man, but of Elohim. And this is where that resurrection becomes clear. What is the resurrection? We brought this up too. Ima. Sharon was on fire last week, bringing up 1 Corinthians 15. He says, how are the dead raised up? Verse 35, and with what body do they come? Senseless one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. This is where we die to ourselves every day. And as to what you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain. It might be wheat or some other grain, but Elohim gives it a body as he wishes, and to each seed a body of his own. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one flesh of men, another of beasts, another of birds, another of fishes. And there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the esteem of the heavenly is truly one, and the esteem of the earthly is another. And we would be returning to our original nature once we go back to our heavenly body. What's that question, baby, that Aurelius asked? What's our nature? What's our connection to nature? What's that question? It was a statement. Yeah. What's the statement? She said, ah. <laughs> Oh, I'm just... It was you fine. There's a book we was reading not too long ago about nature and what our connection to the whole of it is. And so I wanted to present this as relates to what this resurrection is all about in the heavenly body that we have. Oh. <clears throat> Says this you must always bear in mind. What is the nature of the whole? Uh -huh. And what is my nature and how and how this is related to that? And what kind of part it is of what kind of whole? Mm. And there is no one who can hinder you from always doing and saying the things which are in accord with the nature of which you are a part. Purpose, right? What is the nature of the whole, and what is the what is your nature in relation to, right? 
And so this is where we go back again to understanding the heavenly body. The heavenly body that Yah originally fashioned us in, the Mashiach, which he put in us, is what we must come to understand is the whole. And then once we tap into that, nobody can thwart us from what the purpose is that we are sent to accomplish. And so this is what the resurrection of the dead is about. But how do we accomplish that? We accomplish it by putting on in corruption, by putting on power, by putting on a spiritual body, right? By putting on the heavenly, by removing corruption, by removing weakness, by removing the natural, becoming supernatural, right? By putting away the earthly. This is how we become Mashiach. Flesh and blood is unable to inherit the reign of Elohim. Remember, we just read in John 1, it tells us that if you're born of Elohim, you're not born of flesh and blood. You're born of Elohim. How are you born of Elohim? By his word. The word is what gives birth to us. That is the seed we spoke of last week. Exactly. And this is what we are to be. We, are, we too are to be the incarnate word. We too are to be the tabernacle of Elohim. We too are to see Yah's esteem. We too are supposed to be the firstborn as Israel is the firstborn in Mashiach as well. And we too are to be complete in favor and truth. Why? Because we're following our master. Yes, sir. Quick question. Um, with regard to uh, flesh and blood. Yes, sir. Is that why they pierced Yahushua? Say that one more time. Is that why what? That's why they pierced Yahushua. When, it, when they pierced him in the blood, it was like a... Uh, oh, like the rushing of the water and stuff? The blood hit the ground. Um, uh, that's a good question. I don't know if that's why they pierced him. Um, I know that it talks about that in 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 the song and in Zechariah. Right. I mean, but I mean, rising up, he had to. I mean, he had to shed the blood, right? Uh, was that just part right. of the covenant? Shed the blood. blood, right? His blood did have to be shed. Yes. Oh, there's 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 teachings. It's interesting. I don't know. It, it, it it's speculative. I don't know how definitive it is. But there's teachings that Golgotha, as the skull, was actually a place that was just above the place where the Ark of the Covenant was hidden. In that. When the earthquake happened, Mashiach's blood started dripping, right? And so they was, there's conjecture, there's speculation that the Messiah's blood fell through the cracks and landed on the lid of the uh, of, of the atonement. I've heard that. I've heard that very same thing. You've heard that before? Yes, sir. I heard that few. Oh man, I heard that over like uh, I don't want to say about twenty years ago, man. Over twenty yeah. years. Yeah. Same thing. So there's an article, in fact, that talks about that. <laughs> that uh, you know, I was uh, I was reading the testament of Adam and Eve, and it was saying when he when, when Adam died, Adam died on the uh, 15th day, mm -hmm. which was on a Friday at the night hour. That why they uh when the Christians talk about Christ on the uh, Good Friday, dying on the night hour, they that had something to do with that. Um, repeat that one more time. I was I was looking for something. I'm sorry. Yeah, hold on. Let me see if I can get on this. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I was just kind of I was between two things. I beg your pardon. All right, but I was reading the Testament of Adam and Eve. Okay, Adam died. On a Friday, 
Mm. Brought into that book at the night hour. Okay. And then you have you have you have the Christians when they celebrate Good Friday. Right. They said that you know that's the day that the uh, the Messiah died. Supposed to be on right. the Friday. Mm-hmm. But what I noticed is that um uh, it was the fifteenth day. Mm. Not, not the fourteenth day. And so I, I what month, you know? I went back into King James in the sixteen eleven. Okay. All right. Now, if you go to if you put those dates on, they're gonna have the dates, and it says it says uh how to always find each. But when you go back, if you go back and put those dates, like if you Google those dates in them years. It's gonna it's gonna seem like Passover was always falling on the first or the fourth. Mm. Okay. Like each of you ever like when you when you go so I was wondering if uh you know so, you know Bobby reading that all uh, in uh the book of Adam or me seeing that Good Friday was actually in the fifteenth day. So I was wondering if, if the Sabbath is really Thursday and not actually the Sabbath. You're talking about for Pesach or just the weekly Sabbath? For Pesach. If you go into 16, if you got, I don't know if you got a 1611. Well, you know, you, you know that, the, that sundown does constitute the next day, though. So if it if it's usually a Wednesday, because no, like when that no. sun goes down, it's technically Thursday. Nah, this, this, this is what I'm saying, though, Corey. Is that uh, if you look in the 1611, Okay. In the beginning, where they got the table of contents, they got a calendar. Mm -hmm. And if you follow this calendar, like the calendar go back almost like 400 years. Okay. And all those, each day that they got is always the Passover. And when you look at that calendar in, that, in the 1611, you, go, you start Googling those dates. Every mm -hmm. last one of those dates, Passover, has always fell on the Thursday. So I was wondering, and you know, when I read that the book of Adam Eve and it said a 15th day, which would be pretty much like the same. But I'm, I'm technically, what I'm, at, I'm basically what I'm saying is I wonder if we can pass over, I mean, not pass over, but the sap uh -huh. is really on Thursday and not, and not, not uh, Saturday. That's a good question, my brother. Yeah. Like I said, you go back and you look at that 1611, you start mm -hmm. Googling them years, it's all going to fall on a Thursday, year after year after year. Hmm. Yeah, that's something to look into. I would I would encourage you to, you know, do some investigation and bring back what you find. You know what I'm saying? If that's something that's pricking your spirit, I would definitely, you know, encourage you to, to investigate that some more. Right. No doubt. Um, just real quick though, on the matter of blood with the Golgotha. Um, there's a guy, this is from an article entitled The Ark of the Covenant is Found in Jerusalem. It says Ron Wyatt, when he did some archaeological digging, noticed a dry black substance in an earthquake crack in the roof above the Ark of the Covenant. He noticed that this black substance was also on the lid of the cracked stone casing. Obviously, this substance had dripped from the crack in the roof, and provision had been made for it to land on the Ark of the Covenant, as the stone lid had been cracked and moved aside. Ron Wyatt wondered what substance could be so sacred that Elohim made provision for it to land on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. He remembered the earthquake crack at the foot of the stake hole, and suddenly an awesome realization as to what had happened came over him. Ron Wyatt traced the earthquake crack, and indeed it was the same crack as the one at the stake hole. The dry black substance in the crack was tested and proved to be blood, apparently the blood of Mashiach Yahoshua. The Bible says that when Yahoshua died, there was an earthquake and the rocks were rent. A Roman soldier speared Mashiach in his side in order to make sure he was dead and blood and water poured out. Ron Wyatt discovered that this same blood and water poured down through the earthquake crack and fell upon the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. 
So this is perhaps why that piercing in his side took place. You know, prophetically speaking, in order to effectuate the atonement, because we know once blood is sprinkled on the lid of the atonement, on the lid of the ark, atonement is accomplished. Food for thought. But blood and flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom. We know that in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, right? This is why John 1 tells us that we must be born of Elohim. And how are we born of Elohim? We are born of Elohim through Torah. Okay? This is what Romans 12 gives us insight about <clears throat> Dealing with what we would consider the circumcision of the heart. But the circumcision of the heart is actually the rebirth. I call upon you, therefore, brothers, sisters, through the compassion of Elohim, to present your bodies a living offering set apart, well pleasing to Elohim, your reasonable worship. Now, this is to the august body. When you are offering yourself to Elohim, you bring yourself not only to Yah, but also to the body of Elohim, who is composed of all the redeemed saints of Israel and the world, from the Gentiles as well, bringing together this kingdom of priests, because we are accountable to one another. We have to encourage one another to do good works. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Here's the rebirth. Here's the circumcision of the heart by the renewing of your mind so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. This is how we're born of Yah. Renewing our mind. Not being conformed to the world, but being transformed so that we may prove it is that good, perfect, and well-pleasing desire of Elohim. I had a question. It's probably, it's going back to the water and the blood. I yes, often, this was the first time I really looked it up, but I was wondering, did the water and the blood have a significance in relation to in Leviticus 14, water, the, the blood was mixed with running water for mm. cleansing. This is for cleansing of a leper. I don't know what other places used. What verse are you? Um, chapter 14, verse um, 5, four, five. When the birds and the earthen vessel of over running water, mm -hmm. you know, take the live bird in the cedar wood and the scar and the hyssop and dip them in the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. Interesting. <clears throat> um, yes, and no, uh -huh. yes, in the sense that atonement has to be brought forth through the shedding of blood and water. But it's also symbolic. Well, here's the thing. How does birth take place? This period. What two substances are more present at birth? Water. When, someone is, when a child is literally born. There's My water broke. Yeah, that's, that's real serious. Water and, and a woman blood. bleeds. Mm -hmm. So it's symbolic of life. Ah. It's symbolic of the issuing forth of life. And those bear witness. There are two that bear witness on earth. What are the two that bear witness on earth? Water and blood. Yes, sir. What are they bearing blood, witness to, though? Fire, right? Yes, sir. But what, what is the witness that's being born? What's the witness? When they say there are two that bear witness on earth, what are they bearing witness to? Sorry? To what? Witness of, of Yah, right? Pretty much, yes. The Yah lives. The Yah is them, right? There's three who bear witness, the spirit, the water, and the blood. These three are in agreement, oh, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. So with these three essences, right? But here's the question. The spirit, again, we have to understand this. Well, let's go back. This is the one that came by water and blood. Yahushua, Messiah, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit who bears witness because the spirit is the truth. The Torah is the truth because there are three who bear witness, the spirit, the Torah, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. These are all life-bearing substances. They're all sacred and set-apart substances. Of course, the spirit, the Torah, being the most sacred. But the water is the carrier of life, the sustainer of life, as is blood, but as is the spirit. <laughs> so they all, in function, pretty much serve the same purpose. The maintainer and sustainer of life. Yes, sir, Brother Kim. Hey, didn't he bring water, uh, bring life from the water? Explain. In Genesis 1, he said, let the waters bring forth life. <laughs> Teeming shoals. Yeah, didn't he say that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Verse 20, let the waters teem with shoals of living creatures. Mm -hmm. Let birds fly above the earth on the face of the expanse of the heavens. Now, those are waters up there, too. Yeah. The expanse, the firmament, also waters. Point. Say la. So, out of Yahushua's completeness, we all did receive. This is crucial. The fact that he was shalom, the fact that he was whole, the fact that he was complete, we receive from that. We actually are able to be informed on how to go about receiving favor upon favor, on how to get to the truth of the Torah that Moshe gave us. On how to know that Yah lives because the Son did declare. This is what John 17, this verse 18 here, is really all Yahushua is expressing in the 17th chapter. But it's how priestly prayer. He shares the name of the Father. He prays for us to be one with the Father. He prays not for the world, but he prays for those who Yah has called out of the world. <clears throat> right? Those are the things that allow us to become Elohim. And so, Yohanan, not fully comprehending everything, because Yahushua later tells us that he is Eliyahu. Yohanan is just out here serving his purpose. He ain't thinking about who he is. <laughs> That's not Yohanan's concern. Yohanan's concern was what he was called to do. Are you Eliyahu? No, I'm Yohanan. Are you the prophet? No. Who are you? I'm the voice crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of Yah. That's what I'm here. He ain't worried about all the titles and all the offices. He's a servant. Mashiach wasn't even worried about the titles and the offices. Mashiach was a servant. The master servant. And so, Yohanan understands his role. And not only that, Yohanan is in alignment with the will of Yah, which is how he's able to see everything he saw. He saw the Lamb of Elohim. Who takes away the sin of the world. Now, we have gone over before on how we can look at 
rabbinic understanding of the blood atonement Let's see. It's not it. We go to we go to DJ. We go to Google. Here we go. So Let me come back here. Let's just do this. What does that say? On the death of man, atoning for sin. Because remember, Yohanan was like, see, the Lamb of Elohim. <clears throat> Here's my question. What is this in fulfillment of? This statement here, what is this a fulfillment of? In him saying this, what does this prophetically fulfill? There's a statement that was made at an earlier point, that this actually fulfills. What verse you talking about again? Yohanan, in verse 29, the next day Yohanan saw Yahushua coming toward him and said, see the Lamb of Elohim who takes away the sin of the world. What does this prophetically fulfill? Jeremiah, isn't it? I will go back before that. Malachi. I will go back before that. Abraham. Well, give me this exact situation. When he was uh, about to uh, do his boy in, when he took his boy up there and laid him on that pile of wood. And said, boy, you about there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it says, <laughs> yeah. it says in uh, Genesis 22, Yitzhak spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, Abba, Abi. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, see the fire and the wood. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, Elohim does provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And the two of them went together. But when you read this in Hebrew, it says Elohim does provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. My son, my son is the burnt offering. So when you read it in the Hebrew, it, it completely gives a whole different texture to it. It lets us know that it is the son of Elohim who is the lamb that is to be the burnt offering. He says, Elohim shanachim yechidu. So, oh, I forgot Bene right here. It says Elohim yare lo hase leola bani bani, my son. Elohim will provide the lamb for the elevation offering, my son. So this is the focus of the matter. The lamb is not the focus because who? where's the lamb? The lamb is my son. And it's symbolic of Isaac. He was telling Isaac, you the lamb right now, Isaac. But Elohim's going to provide the perfect lamb. And this is what Yohanan saw right here. See, the lamb of Elohim. This is what Abraham saw in the thicket as well. In so many ways. This fulfills that statement that Abraham made. And while Yahushua can say before Abraham was, I am. Abraham saw my day. 
And he was glad and rejoiced in it. Okay. And so he's seeing in spirit, the spirit coming down on him. It's not a literal thing. It's not a literal dove. John has Hebrew vision. John has the ability to see in spirit. He can see because he has chazon, he has vision, he has prophetic consciousness. When we have prophetic consciousness, our mind's eye is able to see things as if they are literally tangible and manifest. But because we perceive it, this is what the image of Elohim is all about. Because we have the perception, we're able to see what's on the mount. We're able to see what Yah has done. We're able to see all things that Yah has called forth. For instance, Twenty-three. What ends up happening here? So, on the third day, this is I have the book of Jasher, chapter twenty-three, starting at verse forty-one. On the third, well, Abraham went with Isaac toward the place that Elohim had told him. On the third day, that's a very powerful day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place at a distance which Elohim had told him of. And a pillar of fire appeared to him that reached from the earth to heaven, and a cloud of glory upon the mountain, and the glory of the Most High was seen in the cloud. And Abraham said to Isaac, My son, dost thou see in that mountain which we perceive? At a distance, that which I see upon it, this word is Salim. I'm guaranteeing you, this is what the image of Yah is all about, the perception. Salim. And Isaac answered and said unto his father, I see in lo a pillar of fire and a cloud, and the glory of Yah is seen upon the cloud. And Abraham knew that his son Isaac was accepted before Yah for burnt offering. Why? Because he had the vision. And Abraham said unto Eliezer and unto his Ishmael, his son, do you also see that which we see upon the mountain, which is at a distance? And they answered and said, oh, we see nothing more than like the other mountains of the earth. <laughs> and Abraham knew that they were not accepted before Yah to go with them. And Abraham said to them, abide ye here with the ass, because you all are some asses as well, while I and Isaac, my son, will go to yonder mount and worship there before Yah, and then return to you. Vision, consciousness, awareness, the ability to see beyond what the naked eye can see. That's what this is about. This is what John and this is what Yohanan had. This is what others who had to see that as well had to perceive in order for them to receive Yahshua. The ones that didn't receive him is because they did not have the vision. They did not have the spirit upon them to see that. That's why he can tell his disciples to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom. Because you got the vision. You can see it. You can perceive it. It makes sense to you. And I have seen and witnessed that this is the son of Elohim. Right? And he says it again. The Lamb of Elohim. This confirmation now. Now he sees Kepha and, Yohan, and uh, his brother, Yohanan. And they go and follow him now. But he lets Kepha know, this is, this is what I'm going to need from you. I'm going to need you to be a stone. I'm going to need you to be solid 42. Let's see. First, 42. What they use that word here? El Yeshua, Vayichi, Kahabim, Allah, Yeshua, Vayomer, 
Simeon, Ben Yonah, Lech Yikra, Kifa. So they do use the word Kifa here. Asher, Targamo, Targamu, uh, Petros, Petros, Petros. And so, Kifa means stone, but what do we get from the word stone? What is a stone in Hebrew? What is a stone? Evan. A precious stone, a gem, a weight, a plummet. Concepts by which to build perfectly. Thus the twelve and the foundation stones to build the temple of Yah, to change into stone, to fossilize. It also means the son of Evan. Means a son. So, Vanim, Ben, Eben, these are plays on words. But it's to build upon. That's why he says, right, you shall be called Kepha. And on this mouth stone, I shall, what does he tell him? When, when he tells him that he's Mashiach, the son of the living Elohim, what does Yahushua inform him of? What does he tell him? Anybody remember? That I am. Close. Can you rephrase the question? I'm going to find it. Let me find it real quick. Okay. Let's see. Matthew 16, verse 18. <clears throat> so in Matthew 16, 18 verse, when Mashiach asked the people, Who do you say I am? Kephar said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. Yahushua answering said to him, Blessed are you, Shimon Bariona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. So that lets you know again, flesh and blood don't enter that heaven. You got to see this of Elohim, the Torah, the spirit of Torah has to speak to you. You're my father in heavens. And I also say to you that you are Kepha. And on this rock, I shall build my assembly. And the gates of Sheol shall not overcome it. This is why the heaven is so important because these are the stones that are used to build the temple of Yah. That's what stone symbolizes. That's what rock means. That's what that's suggested. On this rock, on this stone, I shall build my this is exciting to me, y'all. This is some good stuff. This is some good stuff. That word right there, Amalekite, that's not good. A fortress, sword, right? Sword is Israel. A rock, a refuge, a result of transferring all contained to the mind. A city pertaining to Sidon to the body structure, which is both refuge and dwelling place of the soul and from which materials are derived to build the tabernacle. It means tabernacle. To tie up, to wrap up, to mold, to form, to fashion, to lay siege to, which illustrates the working manner of a builder with stone. The king of righteousness, uniting all elements from the highest to the lowest. That's what Yahushua was telling him. You're going to build this assembly with the spirit of Yah that you perceive and walk in your faithfulness with and make these professions. That's how the kingdom is built. That's how the temple of Yah is established. You are the Messiah. Right. <clears throat> then he sees Philip. 
Philip sees Nathaniel. Philip's like, we found him. We found him. We found him. Nathaniel's doubtful. <laughs> What's coming out of Nazareth that's any good? But then he tells him, look, you an Israelite with no to see. How you know me? What you talking about? He says, because I saw you under the fig tree before I even called you. You are the son of Elohim. You are the king of Israel. Oh, that caught your attention? He said, wait till you see heaven open. <laughs> and messages are saying, call Messiah, baby. You sleep. And then you're going to see messages ascending and descending upon the son of Adam. This is that. It's Cain. It's the tree of life. This is Jacob's ladder. This is the transport of consciousness from heaven to earth. This is how Eliyahu and Moshe got brought back with their corpuscular energies. Because they aren't dead. Right? Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It only transforms. The righteous, though they die, yet they shall live. And anybody's in Mashiach, they will never die. They were in Torah. Can y'all give me one moment, please? Excuse me. Y'all so quiet. Y'all must be over there thinking. Y'all thinking. Y'all over there scratching your heads. What y'all doing? I'm just waiting on you to come yeah, on. That's back. heavy. <laughs> Guess what I didn't do, Brother Duran? I didn't go to the rough. Me, Brother Kim, I didn't go to the restroom or nothing. I'm good. I had some water today, too. <laughs> but yeah. I know you're um, bringing that, that message today. That's good. That's man. good. Crazy. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so, yeah. you know, your water you know, was trans going there for a minute, man. So I'm kind of concerned about you. Say that again. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm praise y'all. I'm, I'm pretty good though, my God. Okay. I'm pretty good. Yeah. Um. So transferring this knowledge, right? We, I was just talking with my firstborn. You know, knowledge in and of itself is not power. No. Knowledge applied. That's power. So in learning to apply this knowledge, I'm going to ask you all, what do you all see has to be done in order for us to internalize this information in order to activate it and then walk in it? What do we have to do? What are some steps that we can take to manifest Mashiach? Uh, study. Uh, I would say study one. Second would be, uh, well, now first would be prayer. Second would be study. And uh, meditation, fasting. Boom. And, uh, Boom. Huge right there. That third one you mentioned is huge. What does the scriptures even tell us to do? Meditate on the word day and night. Uh, and then, what? And, and then, but his delight is in the Torah, y'all, yeah. and he meditates in his Torah day and night. What does that do? 
off. For he shall be as a tree planted by the rivers of water that yields his fruit in his season and whose leaf does not wither and whatever he does prospers. That's what meditation brings forth. Right there. In the Torah, in the mind of Yah, you're putting yourself centered in the mind of Yah. You're centering yourself in the mind of Yah. This is how we activate this. This is how we transfer this consciousness from spirit to flesh. This is how we are reborn. This is how we are transformed in the mind. And I'm speaking this to myself. The less we find ourselves meditating on the word, the more we find ourselves engaging in other activity, in other imagery, in other um, energy outlets, the less we're becoming like Yah. How do we become like Yah? Except you get around Yah. Notice that when you hang around people, you start talking like them. You start, you know, sounding like them. You start speaking like them. You start. Even looking like if you've been married to someone, y'all start to look alike after a while. Y'all take on habits. The more you're intimate with someone, not just physically, but the more you have intimacy with someone, the more that you're close to somebody, right? The more you like them. Birds of a feather flock together. And that's what we have to do with Yah. We have to take time to get intimate with Yah through study, through prayer, through meditation, which will then give us the application of the Torah. And that's something that we can't do together. This is the work you got to go in your closet and do. This is what you have to do to make sure that you're becoming who Yah called you to be. So any and everything that we're going over and covering here is only going to be as forceful as what you're doing with it when you're with yourself. That is how you take into consideration the whole, the nature and the whole of its parts and what your role is and what your nature is in relation to that. Yeah, because now you're centering yourself on the word meditating in the Torah day and night. Day and night, it says. Not just when you want to. Not just when you want to. It says day and night. Day and night. Without ceasing. How, how often are we supposed to pray? Without ceasing, really. Oh, okay. <laughs> without ceasing. <laughs> without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. That's is that hard though? Is that a tall order? Is that a it's challenge? A question. Ain't nobody talking to you, Siri. <laughs> <laughs> Siri up here jumping up and interesting question. Oh no, my Siri is trying to come on on my phone. What is the that's wrong crazy. thing? That's crazy, see? But that's not really a tall order. This is what De Deuteronomy 30 was even telling us. Like, it's not too hard. It's not in the heavens for us to say somebody got to go into the heavens to bring it down to us. It's not across the sea on the other side of the ocean for someone to bring it back to us so that we hear it and do it. No, it's in our heart and in our mouth to do it. If we meditate on it and we speak these words and we become these words, well, that's what we will be. And that's the challenge we all face because we all are challenged with our own personal challenges, whatever they may be. But we have to resist them. We have to learn to build a resilience to our own ways. We got to, again, let's go back. Let's read this and we can wrap this up. It tells us, once again, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 15. This is, this is the key. This chapter here is always resonating with me. I didn't fully understand it. I'm still coming to an understanding of it. 
But this is it. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in disrespect. It is raised in esteem. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it has been written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit, Yahushua, breathed on his disciples and they received understanding. He gave them spirit and he gave them life. And he also tells us the words that I speak to you are what? What did he say the words he speaks to, to his disciples are? John 6, anybody remember? The words I speak to you are what? Life. And? Hmm. He says in chapter 6. I'm going too far. This is six, right? Yep. He says, there it is. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh does not profit at all. The words that I speak to you are spirit and our life. Right? This is what we were just saying. Yahushua, as the last Adam, the second Adam, is a life-giving spirit. He's a life-giving spirit because the words he speaks are spirit and life. So he's giving you life through the spirit, the word. That's how we receive life. That's how we're born of Elohim. Remember, the Torah is what gives us birth. What did Yahushua come to speak? Torah, he says, Shuva, right? Shuva. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn back to Yah's covenant. Keep Yah's commandments. Observe and obey Yah's Torah. That's all repent means. When you really break down what repenting means, it means keep the commandments. It means observe the Torah. It means guard the covenant. Repentance means you change your mind. Well, what you changing your mind with? <laughs> According to what? But the spiritual, however, was not first. But the natural and afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, earthly. The second man is the master from heaven. This means he has mastered first and foremost himself. He has mastered sin, right? This is what Cain was told in the beginning. He said, why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do well, sin crouches at your door and its desire is for you. But you must master it. How do you master it? With a heavenly mind. How do you master sin with a heavenly mind? If you got an earthly mind, sin going to whoop your butt every day. If you got a heavenly mind, sin can't touch you. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the likeness of the earthy, this is what you have to know and you have to believe and you have to seek. We have, we shall also bear the likeness of the heavenly. We shall also bear the likeness of the heavenly. Not just Mashiach Yahushua. We shall also bear the likeness of the heavenly. We can't just look to Yahushua as the only one who could do what he did. Nope. If we look at it like that, we lost. We failed. We will burn. We have to be in Mashiach, and Mashiach has to be in us. We shall also bear the likeness of the heavenly. And this I say, brothers, that flesh and blood is unable to inherit the reign of Elohim. Neither does corruption inherit in corruption. If we live in corrupt, forget about being in corruption and in corruption. Forget about it. See, I speak a secret to you. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet.
the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible has to put on incorruption, this mortal to put on immortality. I'm going to stop right there. This is what we have to put on. We have to put it on. We have to put on incorruption. We have to put on immortality in Torah, in Mashiach. We have to immerse in Messiah to put on Messiah. That's what Galatians tells us. As many of you who are immersed in Messiah have put on Messiah. That's what Galatians tells us. As many of you as were immersed in Messiah have put on Messiah. That's the question. Have you put on Messiah? Have we put on Messiah? That's the perennial question right there. To be or not to be Messiah. That is the question. Verse 27. For as many of you were immersed into Messiah, have put on Messiah. That's the goal of the Torah. If you claim in Torah, you better be claiming Mashiach. And not just the one who came. I'm talking about the one in you. That you're supposed to put on. Who to the we? Who to the we, we, we? That's good, Moray. All praises to Yah. That's good. I see. I mean, really, ever since I heard and really I've been meditating on the word correspondence and that's continued to be what is in my meditation as I process and digest what has been put on the table tonight mm -hmm. is that I mean, even looking at the word correspondence, I, I looked at it and I was like, that's what a Christian is. Um. A close similarity, connection, equivalence. And when you, um, then I went on and studied a little bit while we were uh, studying tonight, the law of correspondence. Just Come because the word, the word has been, you know, like I said, since we, it's been, don't, you know, we've been using it. The spirit has been, the Ruach has been putting it in context of our lessons right, for a little bit now. And when I think about it, I think of a call being made and you are trying to make a connection with that call. And mm. that has also helped put, you know, put put some of this in understanding, you know, help me digest some of this as well. But in summing up just on the lesson tonight, you know, it's a, it's a lot because there's a yes. there's a, a there's a compelling there's a compelling to be perfect, and that can be intimidating. But mm. in the right context, perfection is not intimidating. Mm. And I feel privileged to be a part of the camp because I feel like that still small voice is gently, at least I can hear, I, I perceive it, is saying, come with me into perfection. Why? Not just because you will be endowed with authority and power that that is something that comes with it right. not just because you'll be close to the creator that's a wonderful thing you know not just because you want that protection not just you know there's a litany of things but it seems right and in order and that tastes right to my power right and in order and I have to say that it's a, if what I'm perceiving is uh, accurate, it, I believe that through the scriptures, the nature of the scriptures it is filling me with humility. It seems like an invitation, family. Ms. Bacop, it seems like an invitation. We are getting served up on a silver platter. The table is beautiful. We have an invitation to align ourselves with that, that he said he's looking for workers because mm. the harvest is plentiful. So everything that we need is right here. 
And it's what is that word doing to us? Are we able to, when we're meditating on it? And see, correspondence is about the law of correspondence is about more. If I'm correct, it's about what I choose on my inner. And then it's going to start creating context out in, in my environment, in my day to day living, in my going, my, mm. my comings and my goings. It's going to create a context for me. Right. It, it's going to create a life for me. It's life. It's a hallelujah. It, life is going to be, I'm going to, and so it makes me think when we're in our flesh, when we're in our uh, carnal self, when we're in our nature, our natural man, we are on a war path. With, with, uh, we are on the, we are on the side of death. We are that's the side we're on. It's oppositional. We are on the mm. we are on the side of death. Romans eight. All, all of our contexts are going to be death wise, but when we are corresponding with with the with the God of, with the Yah of truth. In life, all of our contexts are going to be for life. Man. That's the path we're going to be on, it, it, because it's going to it's going to be manifest. That's the continents that was spoken of. Didn't Abraham have that continents? I know Moses yes, did. Yes, sir. Glowing, glowing. It was exuding. It, it was it was it was impacting the things around it. Hallelujah. No good. Um, message tonight and um, you weren't falling on deaf ears. It was just that I don't. I know I didn't want to stop your momentum. So glory to y'all. Yeah, told out for your feedback. It's profound, brother. You know, and, 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 and I'm going to tell you what's scary and I only mean it in the awe-inspiring sense is that we're on the precipice of this breakthrough. And once we break through, it's like crossing the Rubicon, right? There's no turning back. Once you cross this threshold of consciousness, there's no turning back. And this is what it talks about. Once you taste and see that Yah is good, there is no atonement for those who choose to go back to that form of darkness that you were once in. Like, you have to now be all light. And so there is a fearfulness in that because you have a daily moment by moment choice to make to serve Yah and to love Yah with all your heart, with all your soul and all your strength. First and foremost, that's the first mitzvah. That's the first commandment. Love Yah with all your heart, soul and strength. Don't put anything before Yah. That's how you that's that's how you fulfill the first commandment. You love Yah with all your heart, soul and strength. That's how you keep from offending y'all. And we know what it's like to be in love. Every one of us in this room has been in love, and we know that we would never do anything to those that we are in love with. We know what it's like. So you protect that. This is what guarding the covenant is all about that y'all tells us. Guard the covenant. Guard the covenant. Guard the covenant. And that's where your life comes from. That's where your energy comes from. That's where your, like, fire comes from. That's what that ner tamid means, the eternal flame. We should always have the altar lit for Yah. Always have the altars lit. And so when you may have when we may have some other strange fire that what what Nadab and Abi who try to offer on the altar, right? When we have a strange fire that we find being kindled in our heart, we got to extinguish that with the love of Yah. Because that's that correspondence. As above, so below. Correspondence is pretty much the law of as above, so below. As within, so without. That's pretty much what it is. Your kingdom come, your will be done on heaven as it is in earth. Excuse me, on earth as it is in heaven. That's the correspondence. That's what all correspondence is. On earth as it is in heaven. And they call it in Kabbalah, the law of equivalence of form. And that is again done by being intimate, by having a connection, 
by meditating on the Torah day and night. So your image and your likeness becomes that of what Yah's mind expresses. That's the only reality that exists. Remember that statement? The only reality that exists is the one that self-exists. That's the only reality that there is. The only reality that exists in existence is the self-existing one. There's no other reality on earth. There's nothing outside of Yah. That's why Yah didn't even acknowledge darkness back in Genesis 1. Let there be light. He saw the light was good. He didn't say nothing about the darkness because there is no darkness. When you get to the kingdom in Revelation 22, uh, ain't even going to be no need of the sun and the moon. That's what Genesis 1 was all about when he said, let there be light and there was light. Well, where did the light come from? It sure wasn't the sun and the moon and the stars. So you ain't going to need the sun and the moon and the stars when the kingdom is established because this is going to be all light. Because Yah's word is going to reign in the hearts of everybody. And guess where everybody going to be? That countenance that you was just talking about, Brother Duran. Everybody going to be light. The Lamb, right? And Elohim is going to be all light. Say la. Any other thoughts, comments, questions, prayer requests? Hey, um, I do want to um pre present something, if I may, um, yes, to sir. the camp, uh, Moray. Um, I'd like to start um, summarizing our prayer request on WhatsApp and just putting um sort of putting it in um I guess column form, like just you know, hey, uh, prayer request for the week. Maybe put the week. Mm. Just put it on there because I want to make sure we're okay. mindful of it and we put it okay. on. I know I try to remember uh, Ima uh, Sabra. Is that her name, Ima? I've been putting her, having her in my prayer for the week. Mm. Um, but I wanted to summarize it and I got some uh, situations good, things I like to put on there too. So um, I'll I, just put I, that I, on there if I may. I'm going to add to that like reply on that thread anywhere there's a prayer request see if we can reply to the actual prayer request so that we can just create a thread because what happened it'll just tie them all together right so you know what i'm talking about when you hold the thing and you hit reply and that way all the different prayer requests can just be threaded so i like that are you you saying like uh copy paste or are you saying like just no no no, no. Sure if we, you uh like when you're on WhatsApp, right, and you go to a message and you hold the message down that someone, or you, you slide to the right, actually. Slide to the right. Uh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> so you slide it to the right and you can actually reply to it. Okay. So let me see. Like Ema, Ema put this mercy out. I'm going to slide it to the right. And I would say say loud on it. So that way, what happens is it's connected to Iman's post. So if we can just connect all the prayer requests to that thread, we can just reply to it and have it all threaded. It's all together. That's a great idea. I like that idea. On that note, it's crazy. Like earlier this week, Monday, I think it was. Um, a brother who's in a nation of Islam, I've known him for years. He was involved in a fatal accident. So he was actually, I guess he was sitting at a light and there were two cars racing. And I guess they just smashed his car. He gets taken. He's now an ancestor. His name is uh brother Rahman, Rahman Muhammad. So he's now an ancestor. And then today I found out through a mutual friend, my brother that I used to work with named Daniel Smith, that the sister who we knew through his organization, her name is Dietra McCarthy. Dietra McCarthy, I forgot her last name, but she ends up passing recently. And her son had just fought through cancer, beat cancer, but now she passes. So I'm just like, oh my goodness, what is going on? 
So I want to pray for the families of Brother Rachman and Sister Dietra so that, um, man, comforting, consoling their families and their friends and loved ones. The I'm going to go ahead and mute up. If anybody has anything else to say, I'm going to get this. Yeah. Um, boys on the phone so I can go ahead and get them ready for prayer. So, Sleeka, one second. Yeah, I'm going to put my, uh, my my father's family on there. Um, he just lost his sister. And um, we're going to, um, if we can get to the funeral here, but just for the family, I know um, I didn't grow up with my father, but I knew of him, my family had always kind of kept me abreast of him. And they were just people were around. But all, I say all that to say that we've gotten closer the older I've got. But one thing that's kind of um kind of showed me the spirit of the family is that they're losing people and that's kind of getting everybody's attention. And I just wanted to be in God's will that um, you know, that he's bringing them closer to him, you know. So yeah, just wanted to make sure I made mention of that. Oh, man, oh, man. Oh, man. I know my family can relate to it. They, you know, numbers are getting smaller for sure. So I'm no, hold on. So I can definitely relate. Where did you want us to put the prayer request in the uh, WhatsApp chat? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You can just create a, a, a list, create a listing of all the prayer requests. So that way we can see all the different prayer requests. And again, if you could reply to it by sliding the the, the text or the, the, the post to the right, and that way you can actually um, reply and add on to it. Okay, I'm going to put... Yeah, I'm I saw gonna, that. Where did you see it at, um, brother? Just slide in the right. I saw how it worked. Like you were saying, we can just we can we can go into purpose. We just keep going. Um, if we start the river, if we start the post. Did you start on one prayer, already, or you want me no, to? No, ma'am, I have not yet. Yeah, okay. you do beautiful. All your posts are like nice and bulleted and bordered. So if you don't mind, yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not, I'm just trying to get through it. You yes, know? <laughs> yes. All right. Well, we're going to close out. We'll go ahead and get into um, the shepherd's prayer. We'll do the Shema and then we'll do the Levitical or the Aaronic benediction and close out. So in the spirit of prayer, hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Yah is our shepherd. We shall not walk. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. He feeds us besides the waters. He restores our being. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil. For you are with us. The riding is fast and comforted. You prepare a table before us in the face of our enemies. You anoint our heads with oil. So our cups are over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. And we shall dwell in the house of Yah to the length of days. Bay, how you had ever been hailing. The share no key, Miss Vaca, a young mother of Vesha. She in a tongue of a Nessa, but he brought to bombs. The chief to come of a Teca, who was to come by Derek, who should become for Mecca, who shall turn out a Yadaka, but how you had told the four men I am a child. You tough Tom and his new dog for Teca, with his Sharetta. Give a record for Yahoo of the Yishmaretta. Yah, Yahoo of Panama, let me be even Necha. Yah, Yahoo of Panama, Necha. Slice in the car. 
Shalom. So before we say I may want to say one thing real quick. Uh Misha Berach Avotenu. Uh the Kho Avrachava Imotenu. Uh, may the source of strength who bless the ones before us help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing and let us say Amen. Misha Berach, the Imotenu, the Kho Abracha, the Avotenu. Bless those in need of healing with Rafua Shlema, the renewal of body, the renewal of spirit. And let us say Amen. Amen. Yekadal by Yekadesh and May Rabbah. Amen. Be Amadi Vada Kerote by Yemelik Malkute. Amen. <laughs> Mosiah, no, and Messiah, love you all. I'll talk to you all tomorrow, okay? Shalom. 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 And so those were the first one, the Misha Barak, those are prayers for healing. That's a blessing for healing. And then the last one was what we would call a mourner's cottage for those who have transitioned. So prayerfully that covers those who are in need of healing. Amen. I'm muted. So prayerfully it covers those. Did you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, so the prayers prayerfully were, um, you know, for those who are in need of healing. And then also for those who have transitioned in the ancestorhood and the families that are mourning and grieving. So, um, yeah, that pretty much covers it. Okay. Much love to everybody. Come on, everybody. Um, I've already posted this in the room, so we can go back and review it if we like. Next week, we will be on Chapter 2 and Yohanan and go forward from there. Shalom, everyone. Be Shalom, everybody. I told everyone. Shalom, everyone.